Thank you so much for joining us for a very special Stanton Distinguished Le Le Leader Series to celebrate the launch of Professor Ella Washington's forthcoming book, The Necessary Journey, Making Real Progress on Equity and Inclusion, and to engage in an important discussion about workplace inclusion with our distinguished guest, Shannon Schuyler of PwC. Welcome. Established by Dan and Mary Stanton, the parents of two McDonough alumni, our Stanton series connects our McDonough students and community with renowned executives and experts who share stories about leadership in an ever-changing world. Looking back to just a few years ago to 2020, our university, along with many other organizations and com companies across the world, responded to the racial violence and inequities we witnessed that summer with deep concern and really with sadness for our communities, for our marginalized colleagues, for our friends, and for our neighbors. We put in the work to listen, learn, and engage in real conversations about race and inequality, and we then took action. We implemented the Standing Committee for DEI, we created task forces, we began reporting and tracking diversity measures, we created executive education programs to help organizations tackle this very important work, and then we launched our own programs and courses that impact racial, gender, and other inequalities within our community. At Georgetown McDonough, we recognize that it's our responsibility to draw on our Jesuit values, to care for our neighbors, and to build a community in diversity. This is the mission we live by, and we still have a long way to go in our efforts to realize this goal. Dr. Washington recently published an article in the Harvard Business Review about the five stages of DEI maturity. She has worked with CEOs and HR officers around the globe who also are establishing DEI strategies and initiatives in their organizations. But time and time again, she has seen a recurring pattern where organizations approach DEI as a short-term project instead of a long, challenging journey that it truly is. This is why we're here tonight. We're here as we make this journey ourselves, and we will listen to two leaders in this space who are helping companies navigate their DEI journeys stage by stage as they create long-term, sustainable efforts in equity and inclusion. We appreciate this opportunity to host Shannon Schuyler today, who is highlighted in Ella's book for the incredible work PwC has done and continues to do to create fulfilling employee experience and advance workplace inclusion. Georgetown has had a long history of partnerships with PwC, from our undergraduate Smart Start program to our Check Your Blind Spots tour, which we collaborated with you. And of course, many of our graduates are thrilled to work for your firm. The Smart Start program has been a wonderful partnership with PwC and provides a series of workshops, panels, and events to equip a diverse pool of first and second year undergraduate students with tools for academic, personal, and professional success. Shannon is the Chief Purpose and Inclusion Officer at PwC, where she activates the company's purpose to build trust in society, solve important problems, and create a fulfilling employee experience. She is responsible for furthering diversity, equity, and inclusion across the firm's workforce, and she connects purpose with belonging as a way to drive innovation and business value. Outside of PwC's walls, Shannon brings a focus to the role PwC plays in the community. With corporate responsibility as a foundation, she leads a team to harness the power of our business and to provide opportunities for partners and staff 
to use their skills to respond to systematic challenges that have created disparities across society. Shannon also works alongside US Chair and senior partner Tim Ryan, who has also been one of our distinguished Stanton series speakers, to lead the CEO Action for Diversity and Inclusion, which is the largest CEO-driven business commitment to advance diversity and inclusion. We look forward to hearing from you, Shannon, about these initiatives which you have launched at PwC and about the best practices you've established. I'm sure we can benefit from them all. Tonight, we are especially pleased to celebrate Professor Washington on the launch of her new book. So I want to pause here and let's give Professor Washington all our hands. We are really proud of Ella. She's a professor in management and organizational psychology. And something she said today, for years, long before it became accepted, she was very good at bringing academia to practice and practice to academia. Something that's essential across all fields, but especially in this area of diversity and inclusion. And both uh, Ella's research and her client work focus on structural barriers to inclusion for diverse groups in the workplace and working with organizations to build inclusive cultures. She also works with leaders through our custom executive education programs to help companies develop their inclusive leadership skills. Ella is an important leader in our standing committee on diversity, equity, and inclusion at Georgetown McDonough. And we as we embark on our necessary journey towards achieving true inclusion in our classroom, in our workplace, and in our community. Ella, you're a shining example of how Georgetown McDonough hopes to use innovative research to solve today's critical challenges. And we hope your book encourages many more organizations and leaders to commit to the ever-evolving and continuous and important work of DEI. So thank you, Ella, and thank you, Shannon, for taking the time to speak to all of us today. We're going to listen, and we're going to learn. Thank you so much. Bye. So when we started, I wasn't exactly sure what to call her. I was like, she's a professor, she's a doctor, she's an author. Um, so this is incredibly exciting. I'm so humbled to have the opportunity to sit down with you and to have this conversation. Thank you for being here. It's, it's amazing to have you here, especially in the two years after we first met. Um, so thank you for being here. And we know everyone read the PwC chapter. OK, that's yeah. perfect. I see my students in the audience. I know, so. I know. I, well, can, let's start at the very beginning. There's so much to talk about. And I just wanted to know, how did you even get into this work? I mean, you have such an incredible body of work and the things that you've done and, and the doors that you've been able to go in and talking to these leaders and these CEOs and all this. But where did it start? Where was the core of where this spark came from? And, and how did it develop into where you are now? So I see my family in the audience. And, and we're from Durham, North Carolina. Um, and Durham is a really interesting place growing up there, especially in the time that I did. Um, it's in the South, right? Um, and so there's the history of the South and race, especially. Um, and race was always a thing where I, was, where I grew up, um, but not always in a negative way. Um, Durham is known as the Black Wall Street. At one point in time, it was the place between Atlanta and Washington, D.C. that had the most black professionals and black-owned businesses uh, shortly after the Re Reconstruction era. So that was a positive place of pride for me growing up. I also grew up in a space where there was redistricting of our schools in the public school system based on racial lines, mm -hmm. and there were lots of protests, right? Also grew up in the era of the Duke Lacrosse scandal, um, which was heavily racialized, and even though there was a myriad of issues in that scandal, right? And so race was always a thing, um, but it, it fascinated me how people interacted, right? And what really drove behaviors and values. Um, and being usually the only black student in my high school AP classes, I wanted to do something totally different for college. So I went to Spelman College, which is, for anyone who doesn't know, historically black college in Atlanta, Georgia. It's also an all-women's institution. 
And so at face value, you would think that a, a school like that is so homogeneous, everyone's mm -hmm. the same. Um, but it was so different. It was actually the opposite of that. What happened is when you get in an environment where you take out you know, race and gender conversations because people assume we're all the same, right. you realize that we're not all the same at all. There's so much more diversity beyond just what the eye can see. And so that also fascinated me. And so I said, I gotta go study this. <laughs> so I then went to Northwestern uh, for my PhD and studied uh, diversity and leadership. Um, and my career has followed. That, that's incredible. Now, it's so interesting because I wanna know how you feel that this has continued to evolve. So certainly you have where you grew up, certainly you have the school and really looking at this and digging into it. And then we know that over the course of the last several years, all the things that have been happening just got more polarizing and got more visible. And I was always amazed that at the beginning of 2020, and so as we headed into the beginning of COVID, the number one thing that a lot of CEOs did was to furlough their DEI programs. Yeah. Because they were like, oh no, we're in COVID. Now we have to make sure we're managing our funds. So what can we get rid of? We can get rid of the D&I mm -hmm. group. Mm -hmm. And in doing that, just two months later, you had the murder of George Floyd and those same CEOs that were like, wait, I have nobody now to have the conversations that we need to have. Yeah. So how, how did we, first of all, get to the point where you had CEOs saying, oh, we can save some money in doing this. Let's get rid of this group. And then what did it mean two months later? Yeah of the reality, of the necessity, of the journey that they needed to be on? It was so eye-opening thinking about that time um, because I think a, a Glassdoor survey said that 60% of diversity-related roles were cut, even higher than the percentage of HR roles, which we know often happens in economic downturns, right? So higher than regular HR roles, diversity roles were slashed. And then by the end of that same year, there was a tripling <laughs> of chief diversity officer and other diversity leadership roles. And so to me, that is a clear signal that companies were not intentional about their diversity efforts prior to the racial reckoning of 2020 and all the other things that happened around that time. Um, and it was an opportunity to say, are we serious about this or not? Because we know that history often will repeat itself. This was not the first time that we had a surge of, of effort or a surge of interest around DEI. Now, it's the first time we saw it at this scale, at the global scale, mm -hmm. at the scale of or organizations really being um, really clear about words like racial equity or social justice. So it was different in that way. But you can see different points of history where DEI is the, the cool thing to do and people are talking about it and then all of a sudden we forget. It becomes less important. And so what I feared is that it was just going to be another moment mm -hmm. in time. Um, it also was quite shocking because a lot of people thought DEI started in 2020. I know, I know, and brand it's, new. It's like, wow, okay, there's been 40 years of research and so much more that happened even before we got to diversity management, which is what it was called when it, in it, during its inception in the late um, 80s and early 90s, right? And so I didn't want people to forget, like one, yes, this is a journey, but we've been to some of these places before. Um, and I, I felt there was a need to kind of demystify what DEI was all about. Mm -hmm. Because people kept saying, it's a journey, it's a journey. But when I would ask one or two follow-up questions, there would be silence. Um, and so that's how you know, I came to understand that there was a need for this book at that critical time with all the data that we were seeing, with the trends that we were seeing. I didn't want us to lose the, the captive audience that we had because I know three years later would come. Here we are, 2023, and there may be some shifting of sentiment and hopefully not, but history has shown us shifting of commitment as well. Well, it's so interesting that you say that people were doing this, but they didn't necessarily really know that they were doing it or the type of journey that they were on. I think for a good 20 plus years, and I will put PwC in that bucket for, for many of those, we kind of just thought we would program our way out of it, right? Like just send the people who are black to this conference and we'll send them, well, it'll be great. They'll yeah. come back and everything will be. And we didn't realize that if you're going to get to actually systemic change, it's not about a program. It's about looking at the entire encompassing processes and how do you have to be surgical and really making sure that they're equitable? Mm -hmm. when, when you started to have those conversations with those leaders, were they there? Were they talking about like, wait, what, what is the program that I can have <laughs> that will suddenly go and fix my numbers and I'll yeah. be able to recruit and promote and everything equitably? Or did you see that people were starting to say, we actually have to set some standards and some goals and some, what, where were they yeah. when you were starting to do this? 
Well, they had no idea where they <laughs> there were. You go. There you go. So, uh, you know, I often say that the impetus for this book was I kept having conversations over the summer of 2020 with chief human resource officers, with CEOs, and two questions would always happen. And usually at the end of the meeting, they would pull me aside and not ask in front of everyone. Um, but they would ask me, where are we on the journey? They kept asking that. And then they would ask, and how do we compare to other people? Mm -hmm. And so they had no idea where they were on the journey. They knew they had been doing programs maybe for 20 plus years, like a PwC, or they knew they were probably behind the ball, but not quite sure exactly where to start. And so I got that question from companies all across the journey at many different phases. And so I knew that there was a gap there in understanding what is the journey about and then have to get to where we are. And so once we started to have those conversations about what is the DEI journey, what does it look like, what does the possible trajectory look like for your organization, then we could have those higher level conversations of what does progress really look like? What are the metrics? What are the programs that are helpful? Mm -hmm. And what do we do beyond programs? Because the other thing we see is training. Right. I think that was the other uh, lever that was often pulled. It's like, okay, we got these programs. Let's do a company-wide training, and then we're good to go. And we also know that also does not create uh, systemic change. No, there's very few things that we do one and done, except for that was kind of the annual training or something that yeah. happened. When you, when you look at where people were, do you think that it was a lot of, do you think it was fear to take a step? Do you think it was um, realizing that you have a lot of CEOs and others that are competitive? So a lot of, I wanna know where somebody else is and as long as I'm kind of where they are, maybe it's not too bad. Yeah. Um, do you think that some of them felt a shame of not doing more? Like how did you get into their psyche of how they were feeling and, and how would that actually move to them wanting to pull the lever? I think there was such a mix of emotions. Uh, my students will tell you, I often talk about this simultaneous journey at the organizational level and the individual level. And leaders are in this precarious place where they're having to lead and usher change within an organization, but they're also figuring things out for themselves, where they are on their own personal journey. How does that marry or different from where the organization is? Is there a gap there? And what does that mean for the change they can, they can actually create? And so, a lot of the early conversations were some, you know, holding up the mirror to the to senior leadership team to really discern, like, what does DEI mean for us as a team? What does it mean for us as an organization? And not just, like, the statement we just rushed to make right. on June 1st of 2020 or shortly after. Um, what does it mean for us as a leadership team? Um, I, I told my students this story this morning. I, I met with a, a company that's in the book, Iora Health, and one of their senior leaders who had, you know, they had been together 10 years with this C team. And he said, I always wondered the ethnicity of this person that I've worked with for 10 years. And I never felt comfortable enough to ask and just to understand a little bit more about them. And so if they are working in close connection mm -hmm. for 10 years and can't even have this conversation about race, how can you then have a conversation across the whole organization around racial equity? That's just not plausible, right? And so there was this dual process of having leaders acknowledge where they were on their personal journeys, where they wanted their organization to be, and what those trade-offs were that they had to acknowledge. Um, uh, example is often used that we can't all be Ben and Jerry's. Right. And that's okay. Ben and Jerry's is great, not perfect. As my students know, I say <laughs> no company is perfect. Um, but we can't all do that, and that's okay as well. We have to be clear about what our mission is as an organization, what our purpose is as an organization, and how DEI and those things around DEI fits into that. I think it's so important, and, and I think that there was a real epiphany of we can't continue to do the same things that we have been doing, mm -hmm. but not sure about what to do next. And so as you had the conversations and they were asking you the questions, mm -hmm. really, of what does this look like, what are the yeah. metrics, how did you help them to understand, one, it's, it's, they're not in it alone, mm -hmm. and then also that it's not just about one individual group. I think it was really interesting. There was such a pivot because of the murder of George Floyd. People were saying, let's focus specifically on the black community, which I know within PwC, we then had real challenges with our Asian community. Others saying, well, you, this, this, there's different types of things that are happening. So what about that. me phenomena? What about me phenomena? Mm -hmm. And how do you get ahead of that? Or, or what were some of the things that you heard were the concerns about it? And yeah. then what was some of the advice that you gave to make sure you were hearing everyone? Yeah. You had to set the context yeah. and make sure that historically you have an appreciation of what you're saying mm -hmm. is the difference. But how did you help to counsel people? Or what did you hear in that conversation about there's so much? Like, yeah. how do you focus on an issue where every other day something else comes in? 
And then how do you not get overwhelmed? Completely. That's what I hear from a lot of leaders. It's like, okay, how do I read everything there is? How am I up on all the changes in language and terminology um, and do my day job, right? right. Um, and so it's difficult. First of all, you have to acknowledge that it's difficult. It's not easy. There is no, though you can read this wonderful book, there is no perfect <laughs> playbook. Is this is it. <laughs> uh, there's no perfect playbook that will help you to change overnight. So a few things I had to be really, really clear with leaders and have some tough conversations. One, it's not gonna happen overnight. When we say it's a journey, we really mean that. And that doesn't mean a one-year journey. Doesn't mm -hmm. even mean a two or five-year journey. It could be a 25-plus-year journey like PwC, and you still have more to do. So shifting of the mindset to understand this is not an end goal. This will be forever part of who we are as an organization. If we really stand for these values, we will always have to be thinking about DEI in some way. Now, we hope the conversation will shift over time and we're not dealing with the same issues that we've dealt with you know, from the beginning, but this will always be part of our fabric. The second thing um, that I had to have some tough conversations with leaders about is that you're not perfect. And everyone knows you're not perfect. So it's better to embrace that and be transparent. And that's really, really difficult. Uh, you talked about <laughs> access to companies for this book. And the nine companies that are represented are fantastic. And they've all been completely honest and transparent about what's going well and also what's not going well. What's not in there is all the companies that said no. All the companies that you know I approached because I thought they had a great story to tell. And they, no matter how long they've been on the journey or what great things they were being uh, applauded for in the world, they said, oh, we're not ready or we can't share our story or we're concerned about how that might look. Um, and transparency was not a thing. Um, you know, companies started doing transparency reports like PwC companies started doing DEI reports. And not that they just started in 2020, but it became more acceptable mm -hmm. to be honest in those types of uh, reports. And before, I mean, before 2008, you almost had no companies uh, in the private sector doing DEI type of reports. And so we've seen an uptick in that. And we saw a huge surge, of course, in 2020. But it's this notion that we have to be perfect and no one knows that we're not perfect. We can look at your executive team and know you're not perfect, right? right? right and so right. it's not a secret. And so getting companies to embrace that, leaders to embrace that and say, well, what if they know we're not perfect? They already know. So why don't we go on this journey together um, and try to make some real change instead of pretending we're perfect? How much do you think, I mean, considering where we are now, and certainly it started years ago, but especially over the last couple of years, that there are no more sidelines. Like a CEO for you know, years could be like, we're just not gonna talk about that. And then they're gonna yell squirrel and they look over there. There's not that now. Like no. if you don't tell your story, someone else is gonna tell your story and you might not like how it's told. And you have employees every day who are coming in who that whole notion of don't talk about religion and politics um, in your workplace are doing it every day. Yeah. And have an expectation that somebody is listening to them. Because if you truly want me to belong there, belonging means actually looking up what's on my phone and having the conversation. Mm -hmm. How much of that do you think they felt, even though it had been starting to happen, it was there and oh, they couldn't immensely. look away? Immensely. I remember one CEO specifically said, you know, I've been doing this role for 25 years and I never thought I would have to have a conversation around race, for example, or some of these other social justice issues. That just was not in my job description. He straight mm -hmm. up told me, like, the job description <laughs> has changed. And I think it was an important moment when leaders started to realize the job description has changed. No matter how long you've been in the role, whether you're a seasoned leader or a new leader, that in the future, you will have to be equipped to at least create space for this dialogue. I think the other thing that happened um, was the perfect storm of COVID-19 mm -hmm. and what it created in terms of what we expected from our workplace. Um, we, we talked earlier about the fact that pre-COVID-19, uh, a lot of people thought that we checked our identities at the door or we checked whatever was happening in the world at the door. That actually wasn't true. Uh, we still were looking at our smartphones. You may have been contacting your family or friends during the workday saying this or that was happening. But during the pandemic, we could not run from the fact there is not that clear separation between work and home anymore. It's all blended in, right? And if that's the case, then we have to acknowledge that these things that happen outside of work in the world also are blended in. Our workplaces are, are a microcosm 
of what happens in the larger world. And so even though we can do our best to create the best workplaces where there's belonging and inclusion, there are people within our workplaces that also have some of those views that maybe we don't agree with, right? And so we have to figure out how to have the conversation, how to navigate it, because there isn't that clear separation anymore. And I know that's one thing that you, you and I have talked about a lot, you know, how has PwC navigated that shift in, we don't talk about certain things, or now we have to talk about it and maybe even our clients are bringing it up? Well, I think it's, it's so incredibly important. We've realized you can't not talk about it because if you don't want to answer the email or if you don't want to make a comment, again, someone's going to say, then you don't care. And so you have to, and one of the things that you've done in the book is to say what's really important to us and what are we going to comment on all the time? Mm -hmm. You know, we've said we are going to comment on racial inequality all the time because it's something that is foundational to what we believe we can change and what will make us better, as well as our people are asking our clients or asking other constituents. But we think it's really important to know that and to be able to take a stand to do it. And then we've had to come clean to say that there are other things and other social issues that are incredibly important that, but frankly, aren't ones that we're gonna solve in our business and within our four walls. Mm -hmm. And to actually be very clear with our people, and they don't all like it, but to say, we're not going to do that. We're gonna do this. We know that you care about the other piece, but that's not where we as an organization stand. And we want you to respect that, and we're gonna be very candid and very open to let you know. And I think it was getting past the fear and really realizing, and we had to have always known, whenever you send out any message, you're gonna get 50% of the people who aren't gonna like it, and 50% are gonna like it. Now you can yeah. decide if you wanna read the likes or dislikes first, <laughs> but it's gonna happen. And so we toil over like what word to use because you truly are trying to get it. And I think what we've realized is our people respect us as long as we talk about it, mm -hmm. have the conversation. And then that allows people to know that we care and we're empathetic. We just are gonna take this stand versus something else. And, and I think it took us a long time to mm -hmm. feel open in order to be able to do that and to be able to lay that out. I think it's about creating that culture where our values are clear and they, can't, they don't change based on what happens in the news cycle, right? So we apply those values to what is happening. We apply those values to different challenges in the DEI space. And you know, to tackle the what about me phenomenon, first you have to help the, the organization understand that all of this work is helping each other, right? Just because we're celebrating Pride Month here, or Black History Month there, or Women's History Month there, doesn't mean other groups are excluded. We want you to join those conversations. And by the way, we know there's intersectionality. I think that's one thing that PwC has been in the forefront of acknowledging. Like We are far behind in research in terms of things like intersectionality. But in practice, people every day are like, I'm not just black, I'm not just a woman, I'm not just from the South, I'm all of those things, right? And I want you to see all of me, not just me in segments. Even if you're running your you know, demographics, I'm not just this demographic, I'm all of these things. Um, and so part of solving the, the what about me challenge is getting people to see that it's not a zero sum game. If we are celebrating pride, we are celebrating inclusion. We are celebrating culture. We are celebrating change in history that has been made. And that also is honoring other groups and, and what they have, have gone through. And so and the other thing I would say is contribute to the conversation, right? Mm -hmm. If the conversation that you would like to have is not being at the forefront, that's where those grassroots efforts comes in as well. An organization cannot run a sustainable business and celebrate every single holiday there is on the calendar. Like now there's like so many holidays and you want to honor and acknowledge them, but it's hard, right? You have to, to, to choose. And so I welcome people to join in, create a space to have that conversation. It's okay, it, it should be welcomed. It doesn't have to be this or that. Now, how do you do that? One of the things that we were talking about um, before was are we now to a good tipping point or a bad tipping point? Are we at the tipping point where now people are saying, oh, we've talked about this for a long time, now we don't talk about it anymore? Like, or are we gonna keep pushing forward? And I think one of the things that, it's hard, and so when I look at PwC and I look at our reports and what we're focused on, we are focused on a place where everyone has the opportunity to belong and be successful. And we have the wraparound conversations, services, benefits, opportunities to make that happen and we track it and we look at it to see where it's happening and where it's not. But to be clear, we need to do the most for our black population and our Hispanic Latinx population. That is just the truth and that is what we need to do. So sometimes it's easy to be like, okay, well, that's really hard. So what about over here? And let's look at this. Are we getting to a point where you think that we're looking away from some of the things that we were so focused on for the past two years? Or do you think that we're continuing to lean in? 
think it depends on if you were really focused on it or you were just doing it because it was on trend. Mm -hmm. I think the companies that were really focused when they made those promises and pledges in 2020 and before, they are still working because they understand it is a long journey. It is not going to happen overnight. It's not going to happen in 2.5 years, right? But companies that put up their black square or created, you know, these initiatives, spent a lot of money, um, but didn't have any real intention behind it, especially didn't have intention on unearthing the inequalities that may exist, especially within their own walls. Yeah, they're at a tipping point. They're now turning their attention to other things. Again, we've seen this before in history. And so I think the difference maker are that employees are now in a position of power, whether they realize it or not. We know from the great resignation and all the shifts in workplace dynamics that employees are truly voting with their feet, right? They are moving from organizations that do not value them, that do not serve them, do, that are not connected to how they want to show up in the world, right? And so they're calling the bluff mm -hmm. on organizations that you know made these pledges but did not follow through or have not followed through in a meaningful way. And so I think that's a tipping point. I think as, as long as employee voice continues to be loud, and strong, organizations won't be able to turn a blind eye. So the power really is with the people in this case. Well, and I also think that it's with the storytelling. One of the things that your book is, it's authentic storytelling, right? It's, it's organizations that are going through these professional journeys and personal journeys, behavioral journeys, all of these things together. When you think about that, what are some of the stories and, and what did you learn the most as you were going through this and hearing the various different perspectives? Oh, learned so much. Uh, you, you know, learned how you can be so successful in one place in an organization and really be proud of yourself and then struggle so hard in another place, whether you're a small company or a large company. And that's often demotivating for leaders. I think the other thing I learned is that, you know, leaders really struggle with that sense of demotivation. Most leaders are in their positions because they're probably really good at their job. Mm -hmm. They're probably those ones that got mostly A's, you know, did well. <laughs> they want that pat on the back. And when it comes to DEI, as you know, being in the human capital space, it's not a straight line. You can work really, really hard and it can still be perceived negatively, to your point about those 50% of people reading emails, right? And so that demotivating factor is what often keeps people from continuing on the journey because they're like, well, you know, if I do it, I, I'm going to make this person mad. If I do that, I'm going to make that group mad. So why should I even continue to engage? Let me do my day job, right? Let me not focus on this as much. And so... I think the power of storytelling is that it humanizes this thing that is called DEI. A lot of people think of DEI as this mythical thing somewhere <laughs> off in the HR corner that you know, doesn't really apply to them in their, their daily functions. And so part of what I wanted to do with this storytelling perspective is to demystify what DEI is all about, bring humanity back into the conversation, even from an organizational perspective, which is something that I felt wasn't out there at the time um, in other books. Well, one of the things that I think is so important for anyone who has the fortune to read it is to realize that you can make an impact wherever you are. Right? Some people think that you make an impact if you sit in the DEI space or if you're in the human capital space or if you're a CEO and has to have some leadership on it. This is something that you're going to make decisions whether you're in marketing, whether you're in finance, whether you're in private equity. Looking at the innovation and what can be driven comes from a diverse and sustainable pool, yeah. whether that's a talent pool or whether that's going to be your customers or your clients. Do you see people realizing that this isn't just the work of, mm -hmm. like these 10 people who sit over here, but really starting to embrace that all of us have to change our behaviors. In order to be a leader, we have to be willing to change. And part of it is being able to both be reflective and hold up the mirror, like you said before, but then change your actions. Yeah. I wish I could say I saw more of that, okay. to be honest. Um, I think that organizations are still struggling to move DEI out of the bubble over here and integrate it throughout their whole organization. And it's one reason that I'm hoping the framework I present in my book of like what the DEI journey is and how do we move from compliant to tactical to integrated to sustainable, what does that look like? And part of what that looks like is making sure that everyone at every level should be able to talk about the, the mission and values and how DEI is connected. We should be able to talk about the business case, how DEI helps our business at the team level and the enterprise level. Um, and until that takes place, I think DEI will still be in that, that side pocket of the organization. Now, some are doing more than others. I think a pivotal uh, component is manager involvement. Mm -hmm. Middle-level managers run the company, right? Like, you can't get very much done without the buy-in, especially of your middle-level managers. 
However, we also know that middle-level managers are overworked. They have the most on their plate. Often they are player coaches as well, right? So they're doing the job, but also trying to lead a team. And then they don't have time for DEI at the end of the day, even if they really care about it. And so one thing I hope to do is to help organizations shift their mindset, especially managers, from DEI being this extra thing to do once I have time or when it's the holidays or if an employee's about to leave, right? But it's something that I do every day, not because I'm having these big conversations every day, but every day I'm thinking about how to make someone feel valued, how to make sure that I acknowledge the, the role that they have on our team, how to make sure I'm bringing in all voices in meetings. Those are everyday acts of inclusion, right? And that's the real work of DEI. The big moments happen and we need to be prepared to have those tough conversations. But every day is not about those tough conversations, but every day is about making sure your team members feel valued. Well, and that's a great way to be able to go into a section from hearing from questions of the audience to say, this is all about a personal accountability. We all have a decision whether we hear something in a room and we say something or we don't. Like this is about all of us looking at what we do and really reflecting on what we say and our actions and those around us and making things different. Because if we don't, we're not going to do anything to really drive true change. And so, as we said earlier today, tomorrow, make sure that you vote and make sure you get a book. Exactly. And that's doing two things right there Absolutely. in one in day. <laughs> and so you're already ahead of the curve. Exactly. Uh, so with that, we would love to see if there's any questions from the audience. And Sammy has a mic and probably somebody else to be able to, there's one in the back, um, answer whatever is on your mind. One here. I'll get you done. <laughs> Hi, I'm Marissa, and first off, thank you so much for both of you sharing your perspectives. I found the conversation really insightful so far. And my question, one of my biggest concerns as a new college graduate who's going into consulting, and actually PwC this summer, okay. is how do, consult, how do client-facing agencies like PwC handle clients that aren't as far along on the DEI journey? It's a great question. So a lot of different things. One, we have started a DNI practice. And so within our ESG practice, we actually are helping clients to be better. One of the things that we do is when we are looking to actually go into an engagement with our client, we do a client selectivity process to see, first of all, how do they treat their people? What is their risk pile? What does that look like? So we have an idea. But then also to be able to help our clients as we go through that journey. So when we did our transparency report and we just released our next one, we actually send it out to our clients and sit down and have a conversation. So one, they know where we are, which we think is important, and we can help them with the areas that they might want to have help and want to be able to get a little further on too. So it definitely is a conversation that over the course of the years, we have so much more client involvement, either asking for help and asking just for relationship building, so not even to buy something, but to really just hear some different best practices and different people to connect with, as well as other clients who say, listen, we believe in diversity and we want your teams to be more diverse. So what are you going to do to even escalate and to elevate your efforts even more? And so our clients, we work with side by side, and I think that that's incredibly important. And that's where going to what um, Dr. Ella said, this is about everyone. This is about an associate who goes into consulting, sitting down with their client when our transparency report comes out and talking about it. And so everyone along the journey needs to be a part of it. It's not just for the DNI team to do or the partner to do. It's for everyone to own and to be able to talk about it. Now, I'll ask the hard question. I know my MBA students are thinking, well, what happens when you have that client that's not interested in that conversation? Or better yet, that client that doesn't believe in those same values and it's, you know, hired you for a merger and acquisition, did not hire you to tell them about, you know, DE&I. It's different if they don't have the same values versus they're not living them. So we work with clients who don't necessarily have the same path on the journey, but no clients who are disrespectful of the journey that we are on. And so we have exited clients who have treated us poorly, who have done things that we do not think are appropriate in this space, like we would in any other way that we would manage their risk and their brand related to ours and our portfolio. So we do not tolerate that. The one thing we do, which I know some people don't necessarily like, you have companies who have just started this journey. We have 2,200 companies that are a part of CEO Action for Diversity and Inclusion. 40% of them are new over the course of the last two years, the majority being small and medium-sized company who almost have, don't even have their first CDO yet. Those companies are stepping in. They're stepping in a lot to the race discussion. They're not stepping in yet to the religion, LGBTQ plus 
That doesn't mean we're not going to work with them. They're not there yet. It took us 20 years to get there. Now, our goal is to help them. If they do anything that we think is not appropriate, we won't work with them. But to make sure that we're taking people on this journey, knowing that it is a long one, and making sure that people have the same respect and the same value to know that this is something we believe in and it's something that we expect all of our people to believe in. Hello, uh, Dr. Washington. Uh, Frederick Moss here. I'm out of the email class of uh, 2011. Anyway, <laughs> those five stages of, mat of maturity, mm -hmm. could you name them for me? Sure. You're testing me, huh? <laughs> uh, no, absolutely. My pleasure. So the first stage is awareness. It's where our organization is asking the question, what is DEI and what does it mean for us specifically? Um, the second stage is compliant. So are we following the rules and regulations of the EEOC and other federal and state guidelines? And oftentimes, unfortunately, it's are we doing the bare minimum? What do we have to do to not be on a headline, <laughs> right? And unfortunately, a lot of companies got stuck there. I've been asking companies about where they are on the journey since about 2015. Um, and every time I show them my framework, I walk them through it, they often would say, oh, I think we're really at awareness or compliant. Like, we really are stuck there, even if they had good intention. But moving beyond compliant is stage three, tactical. And this is where you see many organizations focused on what programs do we have. And so that means that they're thinking about what does DEI mean and how does it connect to our goals as a business? That doesn't mean there is a strategic approach. So maybe we have some really great ERG programs because we want employees to feel like they belong. Or maybe we have some really great recruitment efforts because we're trying to recruit a certain demographic. But what happens when those efforts don't talk to each other? Or what happens when your experience in one part of PwC is totally different when you go to a different office, right? That sense of belonging and inclusion is totally wiped out. We've all experienced that. And so companies at the tactical stage can be doing really great things, but usually in pockets, right? It, there's not an integrated strategy, which moves them to stage four, integration, right? And when companies have a strategy that's integrated, one, they have a strategy to begin with. It's not just a mix of programs, right? They've thought about what is the strategic approach we want to have to DEI? And secondly, how do we make sure that DEI is a part of everything that we do across all of our spheres of influence? So not just internally for our uh, team members, um, we're thinking externally to our customers, um, our shareholders, our industry partners, right, our suppliers. Thinking around our whole sphere of influence is critically important at the integrated stage. And as you can attest to, that's really hard. Right? It can be easy to get one place of your sphere of influence right, but then you open a whole nother can of worms when you go beyond that. But it's important to go into the community, into the industry, and really take ownership of the impact that you can have as an organization. And then the fifth but not final stage is sustainable. Um, and that's when you can really say that our DI efforts have sustained over time. Um, they have, you know, passed the stress test of an economic downturn, mm -hmm. of maybe a pandemic, of changes in leadership, all things that generally happen in business. How do we make sure that our efforts around DEI don't just dissipate when there's a shift in business or a shift in leadership? And the reason why I say it's the fifth and that final stage is because you have to continue to evolve. So the journey is never done. Um, in the book, the framework is shown as evolution connects that sustainable stage to the integrated stage because you should always be circling back to make sure that you're checking back for what's working, what's not working, and what's shifted. When we think about our workforce, our workforce is con continuously evolving. So our DEI efforts will never be stagnant. They have to continuously evolve as well. And I think what's so important is that some people miss, and I think the, the title of this book about the necessity of it. Because I think some people call it a journey because sometimes if you call it a journey, it doesn't have to have an end. So I guess I don't actually have to have data. Like I don't really have to have a goal that I reach. It just can be a perpetual, like a never ending journey. And this is about, this is a necessary journey that you need to go through. And, and those stages help to actually get to actual outcomes, mm -hmm. which is what you need within the business realm. Because there's nothing that you do in business that you can't measure and there's not an outcome to. And I think that is such an important piece of both the framework as well as just the titling of it, to not let people get away with saying, but it's a journey, like it would never end. Like I will never reach a goal. Oh no, there has to be. Yep. Short-term and long-term goals. Exactly, <laughs> as part of your journey, you're trying to get somewhere, right? Exactly, exactly. 
I know you, there's in the front row. Yeah. Oh. Oh, hi, my name is Erin Boothman. I'm one of many of the MBAs here tonight that have the privilege of studying with under uh, Dr. Washington. Um, Durham itself is a great example of a community that's really has been impacted by systemic racism in the US and how it helps convey that cultural context. Um, in communities like this in Georgetown and beyond where we do have a lot of um, global perspectives, international people who uh, might not have you know, had that lengthy education some of us in the US did and even some of us in the US didn't. So my question is um, whether it's in the workplace or just in an educational community, what's the best way to like shed light on all of the historical information that impacts the way things are today? Um, because you know, a lot of people don't necessarily have that shared experience of what it was like to grow up in the U.S. And um, personally, you know, that impacts my understanding of why it's so important. So, any tips for us as we go out into the workforce? Well, first of all, you did the right thing coming to Georgetown. To get your <laughs> MBA, right? That's the first step. Come to Georgetown. Um, but no, it, it's a really important question. Last year was my first year teaching a course called uh, DEI in the workplace for our undergrads. And the first day of class, I remember, I'm excited, I'm talking about this and that, and I mentioned something about separate but equal, right? And I said, a lot of organizations think of X, Y, and Z as separate but equal, like during the civil rights movement. And they gave me blank faces. They're like, what is separate but equal? What does that even mean, right? And that's one thing, and, and I kept having those moments in those first weeks, and I had to take a step back. It's like, okay, there is not a universal understanding of even the historical context. Now, I'm no history professor, right? And so it's a challenge to try to move the conversation forward, but you also must acknowledge where people have come from and what's happened. Um, I think in the educational space, it's a little bit easier, quite frankly, um, because I do have the opportunity to say, hey, as I did in our class, like, hey, we don't have time to go through all these resources, but here they are for you. And these are things that you should be paying attention to and, and thinking about. And if you have questions, I'm here. Um, I think in the workplace, it's much harder, right? You can't force people to listen to podcasts. You can't force them to have that uh, sense of understanding. And so it's difficult. I think that's where grace comes in when you have some of these conversations. But then also that's where intentional uh, and, and self-ownership of your own journey comes in as well, right? It's no one's responsibility, especially when you're in the workplace. It's my responsibility here at Georgetown. It is no one's responsibility when you get into the workplace to teach you the history of some of these problematic things that have led to the inequalities and equities that we see today. Um, but I'd wonder how, Shannon, you, you might approach it, that. Well, it's a great question. I think, you know, really interesting. Over the course of the last year, we went from 15,000 to 20,000 people a part of our inclusion networks across the US firm. The vast majority of them were white men. There were white men who want to be an ally who don't know the history and don't know the background and want to be able to listen in and want to be able to understand. Now, what we've been very clear about is this is not your opportunity to suddenly look at uh, people who are from marginalized communities, look at people from different cultures, backgrounds, sexual orientation, to be like, tell me your story. Right? Because, no, that's, that's, again, you're putting the work on somebody else versus doing the work yourself. So if you would like to be a part of the Inclusion Network and you'd like to do that, we have almost unlimited resources that we have. Listen to a podcast, listen to something, and they want it. Because if you're going to be there and if you're going to say that you're an ally, you know something so that you can ask a question. You're not going in telling me, can you tell me the whole historical context of what has happened? No. Now, if you have a question because you've tried to educate yourself on it and you don't understand something, absolutely, to be able to further being able to be a sponsor for that individual and not just be performative, but really be there to be an ally. And I think that that's really important because it's the first time that we've really seen the desire to educate people themselves and the desire to say, I know that because I'm not going to get this group of diverse people in my personal life, yeah. chances are, I need to get it at work. Yeah. And so we're finding the first time that many of these individuals are actually surrounding themselves and sitting in a room and having lunch and having hard conversations with people who don't look like them is happening at work because it's not gonna happen in their families or where they're from. And I think there's a lot of power in that. And as long as people collectively can give the space and the grace for people to get it wrong, yeah. which means you have to have a trusted environment so people can get it wrong, that has really led to something that is incredibly unique. But you have to lean in and not wait for somebody else to inform you. 
I think I have a question. So, so close. I mean, <laughs> so close. I, go, go ahead, ma'am. You, no, what, you, 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 I think you had your hand up before I did. Go ahead, please. No. Go, go ahead. ahead. We'll repeat your question. Go ahead. Say it. Go ahead. This is all you. Oh, okay. Well, first, thank you, uh, Shannon and Dr. Washington, for your conversation today. Um, I am responsible for implementing the strategy for inclusion, diversity, equity, and accessibility at my company. Um, what I'm finding is that many will we have the um, the no problem. We have the events. We have you know the conversations, the tough conversations. But when it comes to actually, when you get out of the room, when you're done with the event, then actually implementing what you learned is what we're finding is we're having a hard conversation with. So how do we have this continue on without it being a selective part, you know, just within one event that they have that the people who are actually making the decisions are making the right decisions when the spotlight is not on them? It's a great question. Um, so there's a few things that come to mind there. First, you have to be intentional with your training or your event. For example, Many companies will bring me in for training and they're like, oh, we, we want to train on unconscious bias, right? And we really want managers to have their performance evaluations be less biased. Well, training on unconscious bias does not mean that automatically your performance reviews will be less biased, right? So we need to be clear, are we training around awareness on a topic? Are we trying to create behavioral change on the topic? And by the way, that, that usually that's not all in one training, right? There has to be multiple iterations of the conversation. And so when I do trainings or any types of event, I want to be really clear. It's fine if we're here for awareness and community building, great. But that does not automatically lead to behavioral change. And so in your efforts, you want to be clear, what is the purpose? Like we talk about, you know, over and over again, what's the purpose of this event and thing? What are the outcomes that we are hoping for and how will we measure them? Right? And so if we have a great event that is helping managers to, to know what it's like to, to be more inclusive, then what's the accountability that we'll have to follow that up? So in addition to being really intentional about what you're doing, you have to have some sense of accountability. You can't give all these great tools and tactics and tips and expect people to remember them. Right? There's so much that we have on our cognitive load. And so there has to be systems of accountability built into the structure. So whether it's their performance reviews or checking in with their immediate managers or other metrics and measures in place to make sure they're bringing what they learned at that event and they're implementing it. And it's not just this thing or they happen to remember that lovely thing that that you know, presenter said. No, it's a great question. I think two things. And, and accountability is so key. And so we look at it. Inclusive leadership is a part of our actual performance framework. So you actually have to demonstrate at all levels, what is it like to be an inclusive leader? What does it look like? What did that have to, what did you have to do to show that? And if you don't progress on that, you don't progress. Like that's one of the five levels. It's right along technical competency and the other kind of acumen that we expect within the organization. So it has to be there. So it's not just episodic, but you realize it's a part of the things that we think you need to demonstrate every day in order to progress. And I think that that accountability is incredibly important to be able to have in the fabric of things. You also have to give people the room to practice. One of the things that I realized that we hadn't done so much of in training, like you would train, right? But, but once you get out, you got to actually have people continue to figure out what does that conversation look like? So we have a lot, a lot of candid conversations. Our training now is actually also done with avatars and also done that makes you very uncomfortable. Because in order for you to finally give that constructive feedback that you have not given because you are afraid to give it, because you're afraid of what that person will do or afraid of perception, you need to do it over and over and over again until you can get past that fear to actually be able to deliver it. So what we really focus on is, yes, you can learn. Like this is kind of the framework on what I should do, but the biggest part is how do you practice that and practice it so that somebody can give you feedback. Initially, somebody who isn't actually there and being able to do it and coach you. But then again, how do you do that with your team and then let them give you feedback? Because everyone in our firm is required to do an inclusive mindset badge. And in order to earn that, you have to get feedback throughout the year from your own team of are you doing it? And it's required. So it's something that you have to continue to do. I think if it's something that's episodic, 
then you're really not going to change. I mean, this is deep, this is deep rooted. Mm -hmm. Like this is your wires were crossed when you were, you know, a munchkin and you can't uncross it. And you have to be able to do it over and over again to be able to sense why are you making the decisions that you're making and how can you really be more intentional? And that is a day-to-day -day reflection that you just have to continue to be able to push forward on. And the research supports that. The research supports that the most effective uh, DEI type of trainings are those where people have the space to experiment and fail. And so oftentimes I'll have conversations with leaders, everyone's nodding their head, yeah, we do this, it's easy, I got this. And then I say, go do it. Go have a conversation with your team member, report back the next time we meet. And then they come back and they're leaning all the way in now instead of like checking their phones, they're like, okay, that was actually harder than I thought. Let's talk some more, right? And so you have to create spaces, whether it's in a one-time situation or over time for leaders especially, but people in general to try something in a safe space and fail. And the research supports that is the most effective DEI training when it's married with systemic efforts, not just training by itself. All right, that's my question now. Um, Professor Washington, congratulations on, on the book. Uh, super happy as a fellow uh, Northwestern alum as well. I go by PB, my initials. Earlier in the, in the talk, you touched on DEI, not just a C-suite project. Uh, it's everybody's job. Uh, what in your journey have you seen as, as good ingredients for an enterprise where uh, everybody really feels important and does their part? Um, I'm in housing. Housing has a ton of really terrible history. Um, uh, how, do you, how do you lead an organization where uh, if I'm in marketing, I'm empowered to make the right choice on what images I'm going to put on the brochure uh, as opposed to just it's a CEO kind of job, right? Uh, what, what are some of the ingredients you have seen in organizations where that kind of empowerment is successful? Yeah, great question. Thank you for it. Um, so in my book, I talk about kind of the, the three takeaways that everyone should remember no matter what level you are in the organization. It's purpose, pitfalls, and progress. And so purpose, we've talked a lot about tonight. You know, what is DEI? What does it mean for us? Why is it important? How does it integrate with our business? That pitfalls, that transparency, what are we not doing? What's holding us back? Even at the manager level or even at the individual level, you have to have, be able to have that honest conversation. Like, what is it about our marketing that we have not yet been honest about, about why we can't reach certain populations or why we haven't gone out into broaden our perspective, right, on that marketing? Those pitfalls are, are key because until you acknowledge those things that are holding us back or reasons or trade-offs maybe that we didn't realize that we needed to make, we'll never be able to make progress. And progress is that third P, what does progress look like? So for you, bringing it down to your scope of control within the organization, what does progress look like in your marketing materials? Is it that 70% you know, of them represent some type of diverse uh, representation? Is it that you're representing the communities that you're marketing within? I mean, it can look like a whole bunch of different things, but you have to get really granular, short-term and long-term, on what that progress can look like. And so I think that if everyone in an organization was really clear on those three Ps, and the, the big P usually comes from the top, right? What is our mission and or, as an organization? But those pitfalls, we all have them, right? At the individual level, at every level of the organization, how can we be more honest about where we're struggling and then find solutions for that so we can make that last P of progress? Uh, good evening. My name is Everett Bellamy, and for the last year and a half, I've been serving as Interim Director of the Office of Equity and Inclusion at Georgetown Law Center. And Georgetown Law, in fact, was one of the first law schools in the country to have a director's position. Thank you, Dr. Washington, for taking on this tremendous, uh, important topic and writing your book. I look forward to reading it. I, the, my question is, and when you were reviewing companies and having the conversations, how many of them fail to provide adequate reporting responsibilities and resources for the DEI uh, officer or department? I appreciate what you're saying, both of you are saying about it should be run throughout the fabric of the company, but eventually, the, you know, someone has to be responsible for it. Is the person reporting to human resources and reporting to CEO? Uh, did you come across that, that problem with the companies you reviewed? 
Absolutely. And Shannon and I had a great conversation <laughs> earlier. It's still a pervasive problem. And thank you for all the work that you're doing at the at Law Center. We hear about it a lot, especially from our um, executive MBA students. And so thank you for all the work that you're doing. Um, yeah, we hear about that problem a lot. One, who should we report to? But then also, it's beyond just reporting structure. It's what resources are given. We know that there is such high attrition levels for those CDO, Chief Diversity Officer roles, because they don't re really have the infrastructure or resources to support them. So it's hard enough to identify who is responsible. But even once you get a person, you have to make sure they're not being groomed as a scapegoat if this doesn't work, and if it doesn't work in one year. It's not gonna work in one year, first of all, okay? So we already see that as a challenge when CDOs or like individuals are put in positions. And you know they're really glass cliff positions often because they don't have the infrastructure and support. So to your initial question, did I see that a lot? Absolutely. Um, with the companies that are in my book, the great thing is they all don't have CDOs. Uh, there, there is not one one-size-fits-all approach. So for some companies, a CDO is absolutely the right way to go, and we talk about what that structure looks like. For other companies, they might may be at a place in their journey, they really need a grassroots effort, or they really need some other type of mechanism, right? A CDO is not a, a quick fix to your DEI challenges, you really have to think about the infrastructure of your organization. Now, I think in the best case scenarios, there are at least a person or persons that are responsible for it. But oftentimes we see people that are responsible for it and maybe they have two or three other jobs that they're often responsible for, so they can't really give it all the attention that it deserves. Um, or there's no clear metrics in place for success. And so they get in this role, you know, everyone is happy that someone now will own it. And at the end of a year or two years, they haven't magically turned the organization into the most inclusive place there is, and their job is in jeopardy. And people are looking at them like, what have you actually done? Because that structure was not in place the same way it was in place for other leadership roles. It's really interesting. There's so many different models that are out there, and I don't know if there's one, again, to your point, that works ideally for everyone. You have some that are like that everything's gonna stay within the CDO office, right? Everything will be there. Well, if you do that, then you do two things. One, everyone just throws it over the wall. They're like, this is a problem. Then that group is in charge of it. And regardless, you're never gonna have enough people, right? We have 65,000 people in the US. There is no way I'm gonna figure out what is happening and why someone is not getting promoted who is diverse in Washington state with my team doing that. I need somebody who's actually sitting there on that team to help me to figure it out, which is why I think we talk so much about how does it get baked into all of these various different things. But to some people, that, so that's limiting when you have this department that's there. Some organizations have gone to, you have one or two people at that higher level, and then you embed people throughout the other parts of the organization. So you have somebody on the recruiting team who actually focuses on diversity. You have somebody who sits in procurement focused on diversity. You have somebody who sits on um, you know, deployment or whatever that looks like who focuses on it. Because that's then how you can get to actually the system that is controlling each one of those areas to be able to basically infiltrate it to make it there versus having people think it's gonna come back to this smaller group that's in the center. So I think it all is based upon how that CEO and how leadership is actually saying we want the voice to actually truly drive it. And then how are we all gonna be accountable for what that goal is? I mean, I think people have been terrified to set goals and we all have different words for them. We started with aspirations because we were like, it's less scary to start with an aspiration. And then we were like, no, we're gonna set a goal. We go like, okay, ready, move to a goal. So I think it depends because as long as people have something that they're going for and you can hold people accountable to it, then I think whether it's the small group in the center that's trying to get it done or how dispersed it is, you have a better shot at it. So with that, I'm getting the nod that it is time to uh, release us into our fantastic reception that we will have. Um, I just want to take a moment to thank all of you for being here. I especially want to thank my family who's here um, and my friends, um, my colleagues who are here, um, and all my students. And you know, this work would not be possible without the hard questions you all asked me in class, so thank you. Um, it wouldn't be possible without the support of my community. Um, and so I just want to thank you all for being here. And I look forward to your continued questions and thoughts and pushing me further and pushing this work further because it really is vital to the success of not only our businesses, but our world moving forward. 
And so with that, I will uh, ask you all to please join us in the front uh, area where we are having a reception. And thank you again for coming. And buy a book yeah. tomorrow. <laughs> vote, buy a book. Vote, 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 buy a book. <laughs>